in the interest of time, we included the speaker bios in the chat for your review at your leisure. So when you get a second, go out there and take a look. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Let me see here. Let me get, uh, let's get this. We'll start sharing here. Can you all see the the, the um, slideshow? Yes. May, may I call in also so we don't get background noise outside? Sure. Thank you. Well, all right, all. Well, beaming out of the great state of Georgia, welcome and thank you for joining the webinar series, Connecting States Financial, Economic, and Digital Inclusion Initiatives. My name is Terry Lee, and I'm a CUNY Affairs Specialist for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation located in Atlanta, Georgia. And since we have such a diverse group today, let me briefly mention that FDIC is an independent agency created by Congress to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. To accomplish this mission, the FDIC ensures deposits, examines and supervises financial institutions for safety and soundness and consumer protection, makes large and complex financial institutions resolvable, and manages receiverships. <clears throat> in our first webinar, Challenges of Systemic Inclusion, Unpacking Siloed Conversations for Greater Collaboration, we have assembled an esteemed cast of thought leaders, innovators, and super collaborators. As we move through this webinar series, you will find the same caliber of individuals throughout, which is quite impressive. Here's a webinar series lineup that will guide us over the next couple of months as we highlight and uncover systemic approaches to assist states digital equity planning leaders connect and collaborate with local, state, and national financial and economic inclusion leaders. Here's a snapshot of this afternoon's uh, um, agenda. As you can see, we have Executive Director Bob McLaughlin with us. Telecommunications policy analyst Francine Akwa, excuse me, Francine. I'm sorry about that. Akswani, Director Patrick Eiholtz, Executive Director Marquita Robertson, Executive Director Gary Hanley, and East Region Executive for Community Engagement Michelle Henry, and also Michelle Chandra. Also, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Bola Delano. Uh, with Bank on Illinois, who was scheduled to participate, but the universe had other plans. And so, you know, here's to her health and being on the mend. As you may have noticed, we are not here for a long time, but we are here for a meaningful time together with other like minded folks, such as yourself, joining in on the call. So, to help frame our panelists' comments, our presenters were asked to share from their vantage point, promising an impact impactful inclusion resources, how their efforts stand ready to support those addressing other inclusion dimensions, how addressing those dimensions, <clears throat> excuse me, how addressing those uh, other inclusion dimensions can help enhance their desired outcomes. And of course, this notion of systemic inclusion, financial, economic, education, and digital. So the views expressed in this presentation are the presenters and do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So having said that, now I feel a little liberated. So just a, you know, just a quick comment before I get out of the way. Back in March of 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, the digital divide was top of mind for many experienced inequities, which landed the hardest on our low and moderate, underserved and rural communities. My esteemed co-host, Bob Laughlin, and I put together a webinar series to address the shortcomings of the digital divide highlighted by the pandemic. So, fast forward to today, many are still working towards removing digital divide barriers. However, this time feels different. Different in the sense that all of our efforts will be enhanced as we move quickly to orientate and assemble those of you listening in. We have a real opportunity in front of us but it's gonna take courage. So let me end on this. So if you look up the, the Webster's definition of courage, it states 
a mental or moral strength to venture, persevere, and withstand danger, fear, and difficulty. So as we present and weave these inclusion dimensions together, find the courage to make connections, find the courage to participate in a meaningful way, and find the courage to share your voice. So thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to my co-host, Bob Laughlin. Bob, are you hey, there? Yes, I sure am. Thank you, Terry. And I, I really, first off, want to thank you, Terry, for co-conspiring on this uh, and, and for your colleagues at FDIC making this sustained conversation possible. This is, as I think we'll all experience today, the start of a really significant conversation. Uh, and thanks to all those joining this, uh, this community of folks who really agree, the basic premise of the whole series is that we need uh, folks in different dimensions of, of inclusion to help those uh, in intergenerational poverty build a full staircase with every important step all the way so that they can climb out of intergenerational poverty. That's really the aim of this and the, the moment, the historic moment uh, that we're taking advantage of is uh, thanks to the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and members of Cong uh, Congress on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers who crafted uh, Title III of the Infrastructure Bill, also known as the Digital Equity Act, uh, which is really rather brilliant and it provides an opportunity over the next five years, as you'll see in that first bullet point, uh, it provides substantial funding for states to do digital equity planning, not for its own sake, but in support of economic opportunity, economic inclusion. And it's really that brilliant frame that is about saying, well, digital divide barriers are important. And if we waved a magic wand, we made all those barriers go away, but we do nothing about poverty. We really haven't, we really haven't taken advantage of the opportunity and the need. And so the, the, the Digital Equity Act allows for, but doesn't require uh, us to work across different inclusion dimensions to work more systemically together. And that's really the aim, the diabolical Dr. Evil plan here uh, is that over the next several webinars and a gathering in Atlanta next March uh, is to bring together state leaders across five dimensions. Uh, and you'll see that on the, the right hand column of that uh, of, of this slide, you'll see systemic inclusion with four of them. Not to say these are the only ones that matter because there's housing and transportation, access to food and nutrition and so on. But these are four that we certainly want to bring experts in inclusion from the state, local and national levels together to take advantage of the digital equity planning process and implementation over the next five years to really span experts in financial inclusion, getting people banked, making sure they're financially literate, coupling that with pathways to living wage jobs, which is also known as economic inclusion. So they have a living wage to be financially literate about and put in their bank account. And similarly, that they have educational inclusion supports so they have the, the sustained learning opportunities to develop the skills, dispositions, and credentials to help them land that living wage job. And last and not least, removing digital divide barriers to all of that. So that's the, that's the frame that's, that's informed our reaching out and with your help, we hope to continue reaching out to become more and more inclusive. The fifth and final dimension of this, which is we would submit to you as a panel, really arguably the most important of all, which is those that lead organizations that represent the underrepresented and underserved so that they have voice and agency. And our bias about this is that those are most expert about poverty are those that speak it fluently those that live it and who know what it's about, who know what's what's involved in, in trying to navigate one's way through it and how one-legged stools just don't, they don't cut it. So the idea here is that we are looking to, with the blessing of, of NTIA in the U.S. Department of Congress, and you'll hear, you'll hear from Angela Bennett, who's program officer, for the digital equity office at NTI at the next panel about this, affirming this, 
she and we are really excited to see states develop digital equity plans that draw together experts from these different inclusion dimensions and give voice and agency for the underrepresented from need sensing to priority setting to formative assessment of how are we doing in implementing over the next four and a half years to impact on intergenerational poverty and are we holding ourselves accountable? So that's the frame for this. And that's why the, the, this panel has come together to share our insights about from different vantage points in different dimensions of inclusion, uh, what would we like to see happen? So Terry, shall we? Yeah. So Francine, should we, should we pivot to Francine, Terry? Francine, are you there? Okay, Francine's audio is not working, but she can speak out. Francine, we're ready for you to go. I got you, hey. Francine. I got you. Are you getting an echo? No, you're good. Okay, let me. I think I hear an echo, so let me stop. Am I on now? Yes. I'm a bit of a digital illiterate, so I, I think you can hear me, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I truly appreciate that. I, I want to say good afternoon to uh, my fellow panelists, to those of you who've joined us. And a great big thank you to Robert and Terry for inviting me to participate in this uh, wonderful uh, event and discussion today. I want to say, first of all, that uh, there was another brilliant stroke on the part of Congress, and that was to create the Office of Minority Broadband Initiatives within NTIA. I think it is a rare occurrence, probably none other like it across the federal government. And it puts us right in the middle of communities, right in the middle of what we want to talk about. Our Office of Minority Broadband Initiatives, which we refer to as OMBI, was authorized uh, by Section 902 of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. So it precedes this. IJA and uh, this whole rash of building out broadband across America. And it was in created to extend TIA's reach uh, to engage historically black colleges, tribal colleges and universities, and minority serving institutions to expand broadband access, digital inclusion, and equity and leveraging the roles of those anchor institutions as hubs for innovation and economic opportunities in their anchor communities, in their surrounding communities. So I want to say quickly how the legislation uh, defined anchor communities. It may sound a little restrictive to you, but it's a start and it actually goes beyond that. But anchor communities, according to the legislation, means any area that is not more than 15 miles from one of those institutions and has an estimated median annual household income of not more than 250% of the poverty line. NTIA in its um, CMC pilot project created a 15 mile radius buffer around each potentially eligible recipient to include median household income data, average household size and poverty thresholds for each individual census tract. And that is available on our website for anybody who's interested uh, on the uh, CMC, Connecting Minority Communities uh, pilot program webpage. But nonetheless, we know that that is a bit restrictive, that that, that breach is more expansive when taking into account these anchor institutions. And I'll give you an example. All of the tribal colleges and universities are considered land grant institutions. 
there are about 18 historically black colleges that are grant institutions. There are many Hispanic serving institutions that are land grant institutions. What does that mean? It means they their reach in terms of their community partnership programs expands across the state. There you have immediately an obvious link between state broadband planning and digital equity planning. And it's our goal to work collaboratively across the, those uh, IDRA projects to make sure that those communities, by virtue of those anchor institutions, are a part of that. And that's what's critical here for you. So you see, we fit within the parameters of financial, economic, educational, and digital inclusion, all of those parameters. And we see that broadband is a requisite to address inclusion at every one of those levels in our society. So this OMBI, and you'll see where we fit into the theme of today in terms of leveraging inclusion advocates for working together. Our duties, among, among many of our duties, I'm just gonna point out a couple of them, to collaborate with federal agencies that carry out broadband internet access service. And the the uh, NTIA has published a list of all the federal agencies that, that, that do that. To collaborate with state, local, and tribal governments and these stakeholder anchor institutions and their stakeholder communities in the communication, education, business, and technology fields to promote initiatives relating to broadband internet access, develop recommendations to promote activities that would accelerate the adoption of broadband internet access, and to explore how to leverage investments in infrastructure with respect to broadband internet service, to expand connectivity with respect to that service in anchor as well as faculty and staff of HPCUs, TCUs, and MSIs. So in sum, who are we? What are we? We were established within NTIA's Office of Internet Connectivity and Growth to promote equitable broadband access and adoption at these institutions and their surrounding anchor communities. Say our operational pillars are to administer the Connecting Minority Communities Pilot Program, which I will not go into today, to collaborate with federal, state, tribal, anchor institution stakeholders, and to build capacity at anchor institutions and their communities. So who do we serve? Over 1,000 unique institutions that qualify as HBCUs, TCUs, or MSIs that serve around 8.5 million unique students. <coughs> Excuse me, many of whom are historically underserved. Many of whom fall into that areas of persistent poverty. I'm sorry, I do have a cough. I'm going to have to mute for a moment. And as and as uh, Francine wraps up, we'll get we'll get ready to to pivot here shortly. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Sorry, quickly. So those are who we serve, and those unique. Students represent families and represent communities. We have the unique ability to reach a wide, diverse population across the United States within these anchor institutions. So let me just finally say, HBCUs, TCUs, and MSIs are in 440 counties and county equivalents across 54 states and U.S. territories, touching every region of the country. Roughly 35 million more U.S. residents live in counties that contain one of these institutions than at a county than those who live in counties without one of those institutions. So digital equity is necessary for full participation, both at the anchor institution level and in anchor communities. It's our intent to work across all of the IJA programs to collaborate, engage, conduct research, develop knowledge, consider digital inclusion programs. So you see, we are inclusion advocates and it is in our mission, it's in our DNA. And we look forward to working with all of you to achieve the goals of internet for all. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Francine. Appreciate the comments. Patrick, are you there? I am. 
Thanks, Terry. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, Bank On and some of the things that we're trying to do uh, along the digital lines to reach as many people as possible. Uh, if you go to the very next slide, Terry, I think this shows, uh, this is a slide I like to use whenever I have an opportunity uh, to present. It shows the financial capability continuum. And I think whenever I talk about Bank On, I talk about the product itself, which is a very good product to getting people at, gaining inclusion in the financial system. But the product is separate from what I see the power of the coalition and the power of the coalition really is an opportunity to bring all these resources together in one location so that uh, we don't uh, unintentionally miss something that might be available uh, to the general public. So if you look here in the financial capability continuum, it's not always the case, but very often uh, uh, consumers will um, come in contact with a community resource provider during a crisis. And the goal there is to get them to financial stability. Uh, but what, what we want to make sure that we're doing beyond helping them open accounts is build financial capability. So as you see those the bullet points all around the, the continuum there, it could be a youth development program, home buyer education, uh, financial education, personal line of credit. So the, the purpose is how do we bring these resources together, create one kind of a clearinghouse or one stop shop that, so that when someone gets access to banking, we can say, hey, uh, do you have credit? We are interested in, in building credit. Uh, let's talk about some of the building products that exist. Or are you starting a small business? There's some entrepreneurship training. So that's really the goal of the, and what's so powerful, I think, of these coalitions because they bring all these organizations that are doing fantastic work in the community. They're, they're molding together all their strengths. So you really eliminate uh, the possibility of missing an opportunity where someone may have a need. Uh, and the next on the very next slide, this kind of speaks to what how we're trying to FPP coalition. Uh, some of the things that we're doing to try to uh, reach the world, so to speak, but we have a, um, a, a streaming uh, system called Spondulix. It's a lot like a YouTube channel, but what it is, it's something that Bill Mills, our CEO, talks about is financial edutainment. So it's it's education, financial education that's delivered in an entertaining way. And you can see here on this screenshot, we have a creator spotlight. So we have uh, financial capability practitioners. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a gentleman who teaches financial education through uh, puppets. Uh, we have podcasters. We broadcast conferences and, and webinars. And, uh, but uh, it, it, it's really limitless in where it reaches. We've, kind of, we've had um, people um, utilize Spondulix from all around the world, uh, which is pretty neat. And we're always looking for content providers. But Spondulix is a way to deliver education um, in, a, in an entertaining way. And then, uh, and again, you can access this. So if you don't have the ability to meet one on one counseling or uh, uh, attend a uh, financial education uh, workshop, uh, a lot of this information you can get by accessing through your uh, telephone, smartphone, or your computer. The next thing, the next slide, Terry, if you'd move to that one, please, that, that slide, the other thing that we're working on is we're trying to uh, automate the integration process. What I've found out as I, when I took this role, uh, May of 2021 is that inside coalitions, there's a lot of work being done, but outside coalitions, I don't know if they're all, if we're always kind of um, presenting the bank on accounts with the existing relationships that we have. And then the other concern that I, that I see oftentimes is the issue of capacity. What we want to try to do is, is make it very easy, a uh, very uh, simple process for nonprofits to kind of find who they want to partner with that has a bank on certified account. Because uh, what happens is they follow the national account standards, but there can be a little bit of nuance. Um, some accounts may have no fee, some may have a fee up to 10, but you can waive it and there may be conditions to waive it. Um, uh, some you can open online, some you can't. So rather than ask our nonprofit partners to go on the computer and search each individual website, we've created a product matcher on our website where as you can see the boxes there, there's certain things, no minimum deposit, no monthly fee. Uh, you check yes, um, and it'll pull up all those financial institutions that qualify that. So the goal would be that the nonprofit partner, we find out what is the needs of your consumers, your clients, what's the three to five most important banking needs, whether it's a bank or a credit union, 
You can go into this device, you can pull that up and find out who matches that as closely as possible, and then uh, get, a, get a good list to, to work with where you can facilitate those relationships. The other thing it does too, and this also came from Bill Mills because he's heard for many years that, oh, well, these products don't exist, but in fact, a lot of them do, and there's just not an awareness of it. So uh, this also will be designed to tell you who has a credit building loan or secured credit card. Uh, I found that in Florida, there's a couple of our financial institutions that have uh, loans that are specific for minority owned businesses. And then there's a lot of different uh, uh, financial institutions that also will do real small dollar loan amounts, you know, $300 loans, $100 loans um, that are non predatory. That would be a great alternative, um, you know, like a personal line of credit, revolving line of credit, non-predatory would be a, a beautiful um, alternative to some of the payday loans. So these are just a couple of examples of what we're working on at FPP Coalition uh, to try to bring this information, these resources, uh, as make it as widely accessible as possible uh, through accessing it through uh, the internet or through a smartphone. Uh, and so we do also agree that uh, eliminating the digital divide is not only important for the, being able to bank online, uh, but it's it's crucial to help deliver those financial education uh, products and other other financial capability systems that items that will help people reach financial capability and, and grow wealth and and uh, achieve all those financial dreams that most all of us uh, dream about achieving. So, so thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss that. Yes, and thank you, Patrick, for the for the insight there. And all just a just a reminder. If you have a question that strikes you, please place it in the chat and we'll address it. Marquita, are you there? I am here. I am here. Welcome everyone. And thank you all for the opportunity to get on. Um, I'm Marquita Robertson. I'm the executive director for the collaborative and we are based out of North Carolina. And our mission is to close the wealth gap in North Carolina by ensuring that everyone has a pathway to prosperity. And we um, now know that that pathway to prosperity means includes a lot of things, but it also includes access to affordable broadband. Um, I want to talk with you about Bank On, and this is um, one. Of, this is one of the main areas that we are focused in currently at this time. Um, the FDIC has always done a good job at spotlighting the un and the underbanked population, and in 2020, um, issues related to the distribution of the economic income payment really amplified this need in North Carolina. And we were finding that most of our most vulnerable families were unable to get access to their payments early um, because they did not have a bank account. And when they did receive a paper check, um, instead of direct deposit weeks, months, or even a year later, they had to pay fees to get their check cash, um, further taxing an already vulnerable population. Um, and so all of this highlighted um, a need for increased access to banking, but also um, a need for increased access to broadband. And so that is how we, um, that is the inspiration behind the launch of Bank on North Carolina. Um, and we are through Bank on North Carolina, we are working to increase access um, to bank accounts and also helping our clients um, build relationships with bankers through the nonprofits that they work with. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, broadband and bank on North Carolina. North Carolina, like most of the nation, is highly rural, and we have a lot of bank deserts. Um, in these same areas, we also see limited accesses to bank, bank, bank branches and also limited access to online banking. And we know that um, we can't put a bank there. Um, banks are coming, but we can't do that. But what we can do is give them access to bank, to online bank accounts and access to manage their bank accounts online through this, through, um, through work to close the digital divide. We know that these folks are online. Um, they're using financial services like Chime, Cash App, but we know that the downfall to this is that they're not FDI the secure, um, insured, and they're not always predatory, I mean, non-predatory, and there's a lot of fees, and these are just, you know, the, the, um, the resources that are named are just not safe financial tools, especially for our most vulnerable folks, but we know that they're accessing them through their phone and online, and so when we're having conversations 
in North Carolina to increase um, affordable broadband in North Carolina. Um, there's also usually conversations about how um, online banking will be considered. And we find that the organizations that are doing this advocacy work for broadband are also the same organizations that are doing advocacy work for financial inclusion. And so in that spirit, I'm glad to be up here with my colleagues um, and to continue this conversation. Thank you, Marquita. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll pivot over to Gary. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jerry Hanley, uh, the executive director of Merlot and Skills Commons. And we are a program at the California State University System uh, and uh, at Long Beach. And uh, we are, uh, as uh, Francine was mentioning, we are an anchor institution. We're a minority serving institution, uh, Hispanic serving institution, as well as uh, Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander institution. And uh, I'd like to just begin, and uh, Patrick, if you, I mean, uh, Terry, if you want to hit the button to get to the first one, is one of the things that uh, is really important that Terry said early on was around courage. And think about how important your friends and colleagues and your collaborators are in keeping you moving forward. And, and what we look, what we do in Skills Commons and Merlot is how can we keep on feeding, that is supporting your bank on pipelines with open educational, these are free online training, uh, teaching and learning materials. Because in order to sustain and scale the exciting innovations that Marquita is bringing into North Carolina and, and Patrick is bringing into Florida, how can we provide the instructional programs about digital literacy, um, about financial literacy, about economic inclusion strategies or about educational opportunities where people can develop the skills and knowledge about entrepreneurship or around uh, manufacturing or any area that they might be interested in. So in order to allow these exciting innovative programs moving forward across other states, we need to have this supply line so we're not all reinventing the wheel. So the next button there, uh, Terry. So this is where an open and online library of all these resources that anyone, whether you're in bank on programs, FDIC, at the National Collab Collaborative for Digital Equity, Department of Labor, Department, of, you name it, you can have access to all these free educational materials that can empower your staff to help enable people to move forward in their uh, financial, economic, educational, and digital capabilities. So next button there. Now, how do you do this, right? Sounds great. Having a place where you can go find the Spandulix, all those resources easily that you've heard today. Well, guess what? The US Department of Labor has already funded Skills Commons, which is one of this free and open library um, for workforce training materials. And uh, they provided $1.9 billion for the trade adjustment assistance for community colleges and career training program. And we've been serving 50 states since 2014. And next button there, Terry. And this, what we can do is easily expand, think about adding a wing to the library for all these resources. So anyone, anywhere, at any time would have access to these materials to support your subject matter expert um, that you have who knows all about the financial literacy, but now they might need to know how can I help support the digital literacy skills, right? So we're looking at skills commons as being a supply line, a support to support your courage in your local areas to take leadership. So next slide. Now, all that sounds like wonderful things, you know, be, would be nice to do, but there are often challenges that we've experienced over time. And one of them is you can have banks that have such enthusiastic, passionate subject matter experts, but often they're not sure about how to be effective educators. And that often becomes a challenge for many subject, expert, subject matter experts. 
how do I explain why and how it's so important to become fully banked? So one of the things we have in Skills Commons, a strategy we have self, we built self-paced tutorials and webinars to help industry experts to become excellent instructors, to really have that teaching and learning process become more effective. Other challenges, right? When we often look at what might work in uh, North Carolina, may not work in New Hampshire or Montana, or what might work in Florida, might not work in California, right? Because the diversity of the populations have often unique needs around those anchors or those hubs. So how can you bring a library of material that also will allow customization by local areas? Well, Skills Commons has provided a library that can curate and provide free access and license it in a way that allows anyone to reuse, revise, remix, retain, and redistribute these open educational resources as they see fit and needed for your local community. And of course, we're always here to provide technical assistance to support your success. So thank you, Bob and Terry and all the other colleagues in this uh, collaborative here for letting me share how um, Merlot and Skills Commons, these are libraries, can empower your staff to be successful. Thank you, Jerry, appreciate it. Michelle, are you there? So Terry, you'll appreciate the irony of this being uh, with so many digital equity folks uh, on the call that she's experiencing technical difficulties on her end. She can't hear us. We can't see her. Hello, good afternoon. Here we go. We can hear her. Hi, okay. Yes. Yes. Hey, Michelle. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Bob. Um, really sorry. I am having um, quite a bit of technical difficulty right now, um, quite ironic, um, given the topic of this webinar. Um, so I will plug through. I am not able to hear or see anything at this point, but glad that you all can hear me. I'm really thrilled to participate in the launch of this webinar series um, on such a really important topic. Um, and I'd like to just start off by giving a shout out to uh, our partners, Martita um, and Patrick, really excited to work alongside you and all the terrific things that you are doing. I want to also thank Bob and Terry for putting together um, what's already promising to be an amazing series. I lead a team at J.P. Morgan Chase in corporate responsibility on the East Coast, and we, alongside our lines of business colleagues, are really proud of the commitment that the firm has made to closing the racial wealth gap. Um, as we all know, the pandemic only ex exacerbated health and economic inequities across racial lines, and we know there's a need to drive an inclusive recovery that breaks down barriers and creates and sustains more widespread opportunity. Um, I really love the feed, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, theme here, um, because I think that in order for us to create sort of that sustainable system, we are going to have to also kind of break down uh, barriers um, and look really closely at how um, the inclusion dimensions are intersecting. We at the firm are harnessing our business and our policy expertise, our research, our data, talent, global presence, and partnerships, um, like with many of those listening today, to help to do so. Building on existing in, uh, investments, in 2020, we committed an additional $30 billion over five years to address key drivers of the racial wealth divide and provide economic opportunity to underserved communities, especially the Black, Hispanic, and Latino communities. The commitment focuses on the following. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Promoting and expanding affordable housing and, uh, and home ownership. And this is actually the lion's share of the commitment. We are combining equity and strategic philanthropic capital to finance 100,000 affordable rental units, originate 40,000 home purchase loans, and refinance loans to help 20,000 Black, Hispanic, and Latino households achieve lower mortgage payments and stay in their homes. Secondly, we're growing Black, Hispanic, and Latino-owned businesses to provide 15,000 loans to small businesses and increasing our spend with and technical assistance support to 
new and existing Lat Black, Hispanic, and Latino suppliers. We've also created new consultant positions to help mentor minority entrepreneurs through tailored advisory services, with a focus over a three to six month period on access to capital, managing cash flow, the importance of business advisors, operational effectiveness, and business development. Third, we seek to improve financial health and access to banking in Black, Hispanic, and Latino communities. As an inaugural supporter of the Bank On Coalition, we truly recognize the importance of this mission and have pledged to help an additional 1 million people open low-cost checking and savings accounts over the next five years. We're also hiring 400 new Black, Hispanic, and Latino wealth management and community home lending advisors and over 150 community managers who are based in low and moderate income communities and lead with financial health to consumers and small business owners. The fourth key area of the commitment is accelerating investment in our employees and building a more diverse and inclusive workforce. We're expanding our recruiting and training programs to ensure we are reaching diverse populations, such as HBCU student populations, to build more diverse pathways, not only into our firm, but also across the financial services industry. I encourage you all to check out our progress at www.jpmorganchase.com backslash racial equity. And I'm happy to connect with Bob and Terry on other questions that may come up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Really appreciate the comments and and working your way through the technical challenges here. And that's just you know that's just a a great reminder that there's more to be done. And so with that, we have a we have a special presentation with Michelle. Let me see if I can't pull him up here, and we'll get him we'll get him going. Terry, while you're while you're working on uh, another technical challenge, again, the irony of this is Michelle sharing is 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 <laughs> rather poignant. Uh, so Nishal is uh, Nishal Chandra. I'll I'll introduce Nishal Terry while you're working on. He needs the he needs the WebEx uh, panelist link again, uh, and so hopefully that'll work and he'll be able to join us and catch up here. Uh, so. Uh, what Nishal has so kindly done in partnership with us all is he's developed a website that is now ready for folks to use here. All the participants and panelists and folks that you know that are concerned about inclusion and impact on poverty, we're hoping you'll find this a really uh, valuable tool set for this. Oh, there's Nishal. Excellent. Nishal, excellent. I'm going to gratefully pass the baton to you, sir. Thank you, Bob, Terry, and um, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to speak on behalf of Inclusion Junction. So, um, in about a week's time, we put together a system that is right now functional as we speak, that is able to essentially have folks sign in, self-service, get verified, and then there is a and then there is a process in which we vet them out to make sure that then it's not spam. And when that, once that happens, they're able to go in and uh, search for folks who have been registered and vetted in the system. So, what I would like to do is, um, where is our PowerPoint? Do you see it, Michelle? Yeah, seeing it. Are we on the first slide? Yes. Uh, you want to, uh, let me just share my screen. I'll take control. Okay. okay can you see my uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So basically, um, so as I said, this system I put together. Um, it's a web website, but however, however, it's mobile friendly, so it can be used on mobile device. But essentially, the workflow is this: you go into inclusionjunction.org, you can create an account, and uh, it will go through email verification because we don't want you know garbage signing up. And then uh, we work very relatively fast 
on the back end, there is folks uh, from Bob's organization that are going to vet out the uh, you know unnecessary folks. And then once you're able to do that, uh, you know once that happens, you will get an email notification that your account has been approved. Then you know uh, you go ahead and create your profile, and once you do that, you're able to search for others. Now, we have uh, if you have not been approved, all you can really do is update your profile because we don't want folks signing in and getting access to um, those who have been embedded in the system. And then once you find the you know applicable folks, you can actually uh, communicate with them that we have secure messaging. So let me just give you uh, this is what it kind of looks like. Some of the key screenshots here. So account verification, you'll get something approved. The account has been approved. You go ahead and search for users. I found Bob. I sent him a message, and I've uh, you know. And then whenever these things happen, uh, you, you know, the end users are going to get email verification. I, I mean, email messaging that you have a new message or so and so because we're not expecting you to be logged into the system. But what I would like to do is just uh, do a quick uh, demo right here. So this is the, our website. You can sign up, uh, sign in. So I'm going to sign in right now to my account. I go in, and now there is there is a message when you are new that you have just um, essentially, you know, go ahead and fill out your profile. It will get back to you as soon as we are able to. Uh, I can go in and, and find out about us. And that goes to Bob's um, NCDE website. And um, but getting back here, I can update my profile. So I can, you know, uh, some things that are required. Now you can uh, include your dimensions. That um, we inclusion dimensions. We have several options. You can have multiple selectable. You can describe if you have something other. You can describe that. You also can describe. Um, you know, in text, what specifically are you providing um, service and also the, the regions in which you are in. You can also describe the states that you work, that you serve. And when you update your profile is updated, now you can go in and search for users. And uh, if I do nothing, I can search for all the users registered so far or, or in the system. But let's say if I want to be more selective and I want to know uh, somebody in like New Hampshire. Trying to find Gary. So uh, that's just one example. And if I um, look up who Gary is and um, say, I want to talk to Gary, send Gary a message. The message has been sent. And when I go to my messaging, sent to Gary. So this is just a simple way of communicating within the community. So what we are doing is essentially this is right off the production line. Um, on a weekly basis, we're going to make you know updates on the system, and uh, you know we would like a feedback. We invite everybody to go sign up, and we will work hard to address. Uh, your um, concerns and your feature requests as soon as we are able to. Any questions? If I could add, Nishal, to your, mm -hmm. your wonderful presentation, first off, this is extraordinarily kind of you to develop this. This is meant to be for all of us and all the stakeholder groups we represent as a way to help folks. We know that in the Digital Equity Act, of which is Title III of the Infrastructure Bill, it is requiring, as those of us who are involved in preparing them, state digital equity planning leaders are between now and next June going to be uh, working on rigorous intensive need sensing and priority setting with diverse stakeholder groups in their state to develop four-year implementation plans and funding requests 
to the U.S. Department of Commerce and TIA and to Francine's colleagues in, in the Office of Digital Equity for a billion dollars in implementation. And the, these grants to states starting a year from now for four years are going to be based in large measure on how well each state documents that it's listened rigorously to stakeholders uh, across different dimensions of inclusion, including those that, that bring voice and, and agency to the underserved and underrepresented. So what Nishal has so kindly done pro bono for all of us is to create this tool set uh, that is going to enable us to not only meet episodically, if you will, in these webinars and next uh, March in Atlanta together as state teams, but in the meantime, to help you connect with one another, if this makes sense. Did I do justice to that, Nishal? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. So, can you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to just make a brief comment about uh, Nishal's efforts there. I really think that this inclusion junction is a is a great way for everybody to to find out who to connect with and how best to connect. Um, if you're if you're coming in new to the market and you may not have a lot of stones in your pocket and are kind of floundering, you could plug right in and be up to speed in no time at all. So I just really want to applaud that effort. Um, and so we had the you know. I had the task of moving folks along, you know, really quickly with, uh, like I said, with this caliber group, that is not easy. I'm pretty sure we could have spent at least another couple hours talking through things, uh, but we wanted to leave a little bit of time. Um, if we haven't been getting to the, uh, the Q and A, uh, now we can spend some time addressing some of those questions that that hit the chat. Did you did you see anything, Bob? I did, and, and it was, uh, and Karen uh, Edwards, I'm going to see if I do justice to this. You were asking in the chat if, if what we're all talking about, does this support Native American communities as well as uh, Native Hawaiian, you know, other Alaska Native, other, you know, indigenous communities, uh, and you shared that digital and racial equity is a huge issue for you, uh, and just uh, wondering what uh, folks' thoughts are uh, on, the, on the panel about that. I can certainly chime in if that would be helpful. Because I, I, I'm rather fluent with the, the Digital Equity Act uh, and a shout out, by the, a shout out by the way, to the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and the folks in Congress who crafted that brilliant legislation, including an NCIA. But Francine, please. Oh, I was simply gonna say, and I'm uh, repeating myself, that yes, when the, uh, Office of Minority Broadband Initiatives target is every one of those populations that you've mentioned, um, Karen. Uh, the the institutions of higher ed that are historically black colleges, tribal colleges and universities, of which I think there are about 30 of those, Hispanic serving, Anapeses, Native American, non-tribal, uh, predominantly black, all of those, we are, are our stakeholders and the communities that they serve. So if that helps at all, uh, that's what we do and would love to uh, work with you. And I think I put in the chat that we have a tribal broadband connectivity pro program and I will connect you with Adam Geisler, who is the director of that program. So, uh, Terry, and another comment that's uh, between the lines in the chat is uh, what what can uh, the ba our bank on friends on the panel most? What would you most like others out who are not familiar with bank on to know about how digital equity is relevant to what bank on coalitions do, and how bank on coalitions could enhance what the digital equity folks are looking to do. Bob, I'll chime in there on that. I think uh, uh, the one of the uh, components of Bank On is, is uh, for lack of a better term, is the marketing uh, component of it. In other words, getting the word out of Bank On, letting people know that these accounts exist. You know, there's 
there's two reasons I think that are the top reasons that the FDIC survey showed that people don't have a bank account. And I think the very first one that's most responded is they don't think they have enough money to open an account. So that suggests to me that these are individuals that would like to have an account, but mistakenly think that they can't open one. So I think uh, incre in, uh, increasing digital access is going to create a situation where we're able to get these accounts to those individuals and and provided education that yeah you don't many of these accounts you don't require anything to open or certainly nothing more than twenty five dollars if they're if they do have a requirement um, and just being able to do that and I think on the flip side from the from the coalition standpoint you know just being able to have the, that network of so many different resource providers government. Uh, entities, uh, FDIC, OCC being a part of many of these coalitions as well. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be able to kind of hopefully reduce the time it takes to get to the right people to to get the, uh, the to express the needs that are in the community and see how we can fulfill that. And just a, you know, just a real quick example, you know, if we're, if we're taking a look at access with through bank on, you know, we're taking a look at certified accounts. And if we're telling folks to, you know, go on, go online and you have an opportunity to open up an account online, but then you go into the rural market somewhere, they may not have broadband or it may be, you know, not, not as strong as in some places in, in the urban cores that you have. So that connection there, I would also, I would also make. Well. We're, we're at the top of the hour and I knew it was going to fly by just like that. And so, like I said, these webinars were designed to kind of, you know, just whet your appetite, give you a little flavor, but also keep marching us forward. So we, we hope that you continue to stay with this webinar series as we unfold it in other dimensions and other aspects and continue on. And in the meantime, if you're, if you're so inclined, put yourself in the inclusion junction. So we know where to find you and connect you appropriately. Uh, with that, I'll give my panels uh, one last word. If you, if you want to say um, some parting words, please do, and then we'll get out of here. Okay. Well, everybody enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for joining in. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the next webinar, webinar number two. Have a good day. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bob and Terry. Thank you. Take care. And if Michelle could only hear us, I'd sure love to thank her. She was like, oh, you know, I, I, I don't know if I should stay on. It's like, well, we can hear you and you have a lot to say. So. I'm glad she hung in there. I'm glad she hung in there. Let's see here. I'm trying to my system, you know, along with the other system, you know, challenges. <laughs> here we are. Isn't that ironic? It's, that's very that's... ironic. I am sitting here trying <laughs> to figure out. Yeah. This was good. Thank you for coordinating and including this. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, guys. Yeah. Thanks. And thank you. Thank you for participating.